These days, escapism can seem like a tough proposition. The earth is dying, people are divided on all fronts. Our pets' heads are falling off! Sometimes we just need to kick off our collective shoes, cozy up with a nice bottle of wine, and ask ourselves, who would win in a fight? Jet Li or evil parallel universe Jet Li? My money's on Jet Li. Dumb fun is just that. It's fun. Intellectual discourse takes a back seat to the thrills and spills of reckless abandon. There's something mindfully therapeutic about the switched off awe of burly dudes with x-ray guns. On the flip side, Paul Verhoeven spent the better part of a decade selling high-minded satire as popcorn schlock. A Trojan horse smuggling socio-political indictments in between robotic cops and starship troopers. Surely the double-barreled blast of crank and crank high voltage are just more guilty slices of hot nonsense. Don't let Jason Statham hoovering cocaine off a men's room floor fool you. Colourful commentary, intertextual mashup, and existential allegory are all dished out, even if they're wrapped in scorched meat and trash. Some of the content of these films is the worst kind of faux-edgy, hateful rhetoric. Whether it's trying to troll, shock, or make an ironic statement, there's no defending its repugnant politics. It was bad then, disgusting in hindsight, and adds nothing but an exclusionary stench. What I'm trying to say is this. There's more pumping through the veins of Crank in its sequel than misplaced bile. These films aren't so much paced and structured as they are an ecstasy fueled race. Only the finish line is on fire and everyone's falling out of a helicopter. Each kinetic crunch and high-wired Hail Mary is captured with handheld digital cameras rather than traditional film stock. Beyond the format allowing for greater flexibility when it came to shooting and editing, it's essential to the very look of Crank. The sun-bleached image of mid-2000s digital photography not only accentuates the scorched earth antics of our protagonist, but it also crafts a stylistic identity from what could have been considered an aesthetic limitation. If you look at its digital contemporaries of the era, namely 28 Days Later and Collateral, the reason they hold up to scrutiny isn't the fidelity of the image. If you're looking for celluloid warmth or that Super 8 feeling, prepare to offend your cinematic sensibilities. 28 Days Later, with its surveillance state slash straight from the 5 o'clock news tangibility, lent a dose of kitchen sink realism to apocalyptic Britain. Collateral went on to use the format's brilliant interpretation of ambient lighting to render the streets with a humming glow of caffeinated commutes. If you've ever taken Film School 101, you'll have heard the medium is the message. In short, it means that the very nature by which you're conveying information informs what you're trying to say. Through this symbiosis, Crank is as much a film about our digital world as it is a product of it. Quick turnaround, unrestrained creative freedom, and intertextual referencing have grown across all media as we've bailed out on the analogue age and embraced electronic means of consumption and creation. Sampling an 80s hip-hop birthed the cut, copy, create electronic boom of the 90s and turned sonic collages into cohesive creations. Whereas DJ Shadow and Aphex Twin had their MPC 60s and DAT tapes, directors Neville Dean and Taylor stocked up on store-bought cameras and pop culture crucifixions ready to warp both past the point of recognition. I can't take credit for whoever dubbed these films Speed Without the Bus, but that's the high concept in a nutshell. Take that seminal slab of vehicular action, slam it against any work of 24 hours left to live fiction, and cook it up in a meth lab alongside parkour, skateboard tapes, rave euphoria, and enough bad taste to make Troma wink, and hey presto, you've got a half-naked, fully erect Englishman T-posing as he surfs a police motorbike into a restaurant. It's a mashup of decades of counterculture, right down to the ludicrous cameos from musicians, pop icons, luminaries of adult entertainment, Chester Bennington, and a buzzsaw soundtrack from Mike Patton. In an age of short attention spans, playlists, and fast thumbs, the Crank films are channel surfing the zeitgeist. While Crank takes full advantage of new digital frontiers as both a mode of production and expression, their primary inspiration, to the point of emulation, are those damned video games. Depending on which side of the moral panic you fall, video games are either a harmless pastime or the devil's dive bar. 
Crank sucks the marrow from every megabyte, churning it all together until it's retched into the lens. 8-bit animated sequences, an eye in the sky straight out of Grand Theft Auto, and more extra lives than an army of cats. This is a battered binary heart throbbing to the death rattle of a dial-up modem. Crank delves into the mechanics and popular significance of gaming in order to weave its own brand of wreckage throughout Los Angeles. The first few minutes of Crank may as well be a let's play of a game that doesn't exist. From the retro computerized title screen, straight into a POV sequence, leading up to an exposition dump delivered via a glorified cutscene. In both entries, Chev Chelios is scrambling for health packs, power ups, and upgrades. Every time Chev recharges, shoots up, or, well, he's pumping coins into the cabinet to keep running and gunning through the next wave of goons. High Voltage even goes so far as to include boss battles and health bars in its arcade of excess. The illusions only get more obvious from here. You know I told you I was a video game programmer. Yeah. That was a lie. This nudge nudge wink wink to the games industry is expanded on in High Voltage, where we meet Chev in a flashback to his wayward youth. He's like a ghost. He just plays those video games all day, all night. Video games? All day. Based on Chev Chelios' age, his mother and this obnoxious talk show host are essentially blaming the first generation of computer games for the ever-escalating body count. Yep, this jerk gets shot in the face because of Pong. It's Neville Dean and Taylor playing their hand. It's portrayed in such a staged, ludicrous manner because that's exactly what they consider this issue. Blah blah, fucking blah. Imitation being the sincerest form of flattery, the series is a caricature of a paradigm shift from old to new media. Goodbye Chuck Norris shooting communist with rockets, hello Jason Statham booting a reanimated head into a swimming pool in garish high death. But what about the consumers, the generations raised with phones in their hands and a never-ending news cycle in their ears? Neville Dean and Taylor save the real venom for us. You could be mistaken for thinking these films are elaborately staged ads for the benefit of good cellular service. Practically none of the expository dialogue in this series is delivered in person, and Chev's biggest lifesaver in these films isn't his gun or gurn, it's his mobile phone. They're making a point of delivering the plot crucial information in the most mundane way possible as a direct contrast to every bombastic set piece. Here's a fun statistic. Of the series' total combined running times, 12% is spent on the phone. That's 19 minutes of watching this. It's a Pavlovian response. Whenever the phone rings, the world gets tuned out. Television doesn't get off any lighter. Unresponsive, indifferent masses huddle around news broadcasts warning of an imminent threat. So imminent, it stood next to them with a raging hard-on. The broadcast journalists either stare dead-eyed into the camera or curse with an apathetic sigh. Being treated as the bullshit they most likely are. It's the resigned shrug of a city destroying itself while we cut to commercial break. In our always-on existence, these devices are our guiding star and our stones of shame. So we're at an intellectual impasse. While these technologies have given us unparalleled freedom of expression, we're content to consume rather than create. It was only upon re-watching both Crank features with fellow Jason Statham scholar writing on games that I realised there's more than apathy here. There's a human heart, lost in the midst of a midlife crisis. Chef Chelios is a man stuck in second gear. He's bored by work, dissatisfied with management, and in a relationship based on a version of himself that's a complete lie. One day, he wakes up alone with a heavy chest. He's slowly dying with each commute, each trip to the mall, every household chore, and each pedestrian meal with his doting partner. His own mortality fresh in his mind, he sets out on a hedonistic path of high-speed, high-risk endeavours to cure his waning heart. In this fool's errand, he ends up losing Eve and his purpose. We then spend the whole second film in a search to recover his heart and reconnect with the woman he pushed away. In the end, his final thoughts are of love and the realisation that domesticity isn't a death sentence, it's a potentially peaceful life. 
Whether you're on board with the allegorical angle or not, there's something to be said for a body of work that can be summarized as either a journey towards existential self-acceptance or three hours of a skinhead hurting himself to get his pulse going. Summing up the Crank series with the soundbite is no easy task. Both act as a fascinating document of a transitional period, for better and worse. They're a calculated clash of ideas, occasionally kneecapped by homophobic, racist, ableist, and misogynistic shock tactics. Whether you think I'm reaching or giving too much credit is entirely up to you, and I'm 100% on board with the just kicking back and enjoying the ride. They aren't ever going to be studied alongside Michael Mann or boil over into the political debates of a Catherine Bigelow feature, but if you can get past Crank and Crank High Voltage's reliance on bad taste, there may be more to sink your teeth into. Thank you to everyone spreading the word about In Frame Out. Together, we're going to grow this channel until it's big enough to get me a giraffe. Feel free to like, share and subscribe, and let us know in the comments what action film you think has more going on than initially meets the eye. Until next time, or until I get a giraffe, this is In Frame Out. Yeah.